On Oklahoma Gardening, we always want to make sure that we are bringing you the facts related to horticulture and gardening. And there's been a lot of buzz about a particular class of insecticides, neonicotinoids. And today joining me, Dr. Rebeck, the OSU Extension Entomologist, is going to give us the facts. Uh, can you tell us first what are neonicotinoids? Sure. Uh, this is a class of insecticides uh, that are uh, in the class 4A. Uh, and they are related to nicotine, which a long time ago used to be used as an insecticide. And, um, but they've been basically designed uh, to be less toxic to vertebrates and more toxic to invertebrates, and hence they're a little more safer for, for people to use around landscapes and agriculture. Okay, and when you say it's a class four of insecticides, that, that means that it's not just one insecticide, it's a group of insecticides, right? That is correct. There's uh, imidacloprid that's commonly used, thymethoxam, clothianidin, uh, there's several others that are used in a wide variety of homeowner products as well as on the ag side, some of the more commercial products. So why do we use neonicotinoids? And we call them neonics for short because it right. can be a tongue and, and twister. we can use that word Okay, today. so why do we use neonicotinoids um, or neonics in the uh, landscape? Uh, neonics are, are largely used against uh, primarily sucking insects, things like aphids and scale insects. Uh, they can also be used against some leaf chewing insects as well. Uh, their advantages uh, of using neonics is uh, they are well protected in the plant because it's a systemic material. It's taken up by roots or it penetrates through leaf membranes, um, gets translocated throughout the plant, protecting all those plant parts from those insects. And largely we can uh, we find ourselves only having to do one application per year. So we're reducing the frequency of the use of these compounds. Uh, and again, they're protected in the plant. We, we have reduced contact with a lot of those benefits insects, uh, predators, parasitoids, as well as pollinators. Okay. So the controversy surrounding neonics and the, and the bees, particularly honey bees, um, is colony collapse disorder. Can you talk about that and how, what's the controversy? Sure, absolutely. Uh, well, first of all, what is colony collapse disorder? Uh, there's a, a phenomenon mm -hmm. um, that uh, recently diagnosed uh, that uh, has been called colony collapse disorder where the workers, uh, they get disoriented, they, uh, they, for some reason or other, they abandon the hive. Uh, so they're abandoning their brood, they're abandoning their, their queen. And if you have a sufficient number of those workers abandoning that hive, that, that hive is not gonna survive, it's going to collapse. Mm -hmm. uh, now, interestingly enough, uh, CCD, or colony collapse disorder, uh, this phenomenon uh, has been documented uh, about three other times in the past, uh, since the turn of the, the 20th century. So okay. early 1900s, uh, 1960s, and again, I think in the, the 1980s. Uh, so this is really the fourth time that this phenomenon has been documented here in, uh, uh, in North America. And have we been using neonics that long? That's what's interesting. Okay. Uh, uh, that's where some of the evidence against the link of neonics to CCD uh, kind of has come from. It's, the neonics didn't really come on the market until the, um, the, the late 80s, early 90s, and, uh, and that was when the latest incidence of the colony collapse disorder was, was documented. So, okay. so obviously neonics weren't around in the past when this phenomenon had been documented uh, three times earlier. Okay, and, and I've also heard that CD, CCD excuse me, might be a result of mites and a virus. Can you elaborate yes. on that? So the, uh, the alternative hypothesis to, um, uh, to neonics being linked to CCD is the varroa mite and the diseases that it can transmit. Mm -hmm. um, interestingly enough, when CCD, this latest round, was documented here in North America again, uh, it, was, it, it coincided with the introduction of varroa mite, which are a devastating mite pest of honeybees. They, they parasitize the bees, they can transmit um, viral diseases uh, and some other microbial uh, diseases as well as uh, they, they just sap the energy from, from, those, from those insects. Mm -hmm. so, um, so really, if you wanna look at a trigger, uh, the, the, the evidence supports that the varroa mite, the introduction of the varroa mite is more closely linked to uh, CCD. And interestingly, where uh, if you look around the world, uh, such as Australia, where they're using neonics just as much as the U.S. is using neonics, uh -huh. uh, they don't have varroa mites and they also don't have CCD. And interestingly okay. enough, in Europe, 
where they have banned neonics uh, uh -huh. because of this controversy, uh, they, they are still suffering from colony collapse disorder. And do they have the mite there in Europe? And they, uh, and they do, yes. Okay, yes. okay. So it kind of is an interesting tie there. It is. Um, so neonics are systemic, meaning they get transported through the plant. Yes. Um, can, has there been any research about how much uh, concentration is in the nectar and in the pollen that the bees might be taking in? What they've determined is that uh, for honeybees, uh, it's about a 25 part per billion threshold. Um, so that's the concentration that we start to get a, an intoxicating effect on, on honeybees. Mm -hmm. uh, it's been suggested though that with, uh, with bumblebees and some of our other native bees, that threshold may be even less. So, so our native bee complex um, that are pollinating our plants uh, are, are likely more sensitive to these neonicotinoid insecticides than uh, honeybees are. Okay. Um, Another study that was done in Massachusetts actually though looked at uh, uh, tracking honeybees that were visiting flowers uh, throughout the course of a growing season. Uh, they found out that they're on average uh, honeybees were only exposed to about two parts per billion of imidacloprid, one of those neonicotinoids. Uh, so that's far less than that 25 part per billion threshold. So, uh, so normal everyday use, at least in, a, around, in and around the landscape of a, of a homeowner for instance, uh, seems to uh, those bees are not reaching that concentration, that, that lethal concentration threshold. Okay, so we've talked a lot about internationally and, and across the United States about sure. what's going on. Sure. What are we doing here in Oklahoma about our pollinators and our bees? Sure, well um, the Oklahoma Department of Ag, Food and Forestry recently uh, released the uh, uh, Pollinator Protection Plan um, and it outlines several things that we can do uh, throughout the state um, as homeowners and, and others uh, to try to conserve uh, these, these pollinators. And, and of course it, it comes down to, uh, first of all, uh, responsible use of insecticides. Neonicotinoids are insecticides. They kill insects. We know this. So we want to be sure we're using as all insecticides, as all insecticides right. are. That's, That's right. the point of it. Them. Is. Right. It is. So, uh, so yeah, we know that they'll kill bees. So, But if we use them more responsibly, um, and that means following the label, uh, on the neonicotinoids for instance, all of those insecticides now have uh, um, what's called the bee box, EPA mandated that they have a bee box. And it specifically highlights um, things that need to be done in order to uh, more effectively protect these pollinators that are visiting primarily flowering plants. Mm -hmm. uh, but following the label, um, conserving uh, more flowering plants in the landscape, uh, so, so the weedy plants, for instance, that we might go too aggressively against dandelions and clover, for instance, mm -hmm. in, a, uh, in, a, in, a, in a lawn. Uh, if we can have a little more tolerance for those, leave those uh, in the landscape as a food source, as a food resource uh, for our pollinators, this can go a long way towards conserving them as well. Okay, um, why don't we just ban them? If we know that they kill insect insects yep. and bees, um, why don't we just go ahead and say, let's play it safe and ban neonicotinoids. Certainly. Uh, well, again, I mentioned uh, in Europe before, they've done this mm -hmm. and, they, and, they, and they also have that varroa mite and they haven't seen any decline in, in um, CCD. Mm -hmm. um, so that's direct evidence that it really may be a disease issue rather than a, a neonicot issue. Um, and yeah, neonics are part of the puzzle, part of the equation, they can have an effect, mm -hmm. but they're certainly not the silver bullet. There's a wide complex of things that are causing problems. So if you get rid of the neonics, uh, the issue is, what do we have left? What is our alternative? Uh, and lar we have a lot of ornamental plants, we have a lot of agricultural plants that rely on the use of these systemic materials for protecting them from a wide variety of, of insect pests. And if you get rid of them outright, what do we have left? Well, we have to turn back to uh, using mostly broad, broadly con uh, toxic uh, compounds that have an effect on not just the pests but also the beneficials including pollinators. We have to apply them more frequently so now we're increasing the risk of, of, of having further contact or, or greater contact uh, with those beneficial insects uh, and, uh, and, and you're, I think we're going to have widespread consequences for um, not only pollinators but other beneficial insects if we have to rely on those other alternative chemistries. Okay, um, and so basically you're talking an economic impact as well as an agriculture impact on our food and things like that. A absolutely, and, and that's obviously very important. Yes, so, yeah. Um, so yeah, it's, it really comes down to um, rather than outright ban, um, let's use these materials more responsibly, more judiciously, as we should be using all insecticides mm -hmm. um, or all, all, all classes of pesticides. Read the label, uh, follow them to the letter. Um, that's gonna uh, 
that, that information that's there is going to help us protect those beneficials. It's always important when you're looking at a controversial subject to look at the facts and the research. So I appreciate you bringing those facts to us today, Dr. Rebeck, and thank you for joining us. We hope you enjoyed this video. It's part of our Oklahoma Gardening YouTube channel. You can also find even more videos on our OK Gardening Classics YouTube channel. And join us on social media for great gardening tips, photos, and discussion.